Thank you so very, very much. It has been a, a real delight listening to you all over these last couple of days. Um, uh, and, and I must admit, I'm feeling a little bit intimidated. Y'all was really wonderful. <laughs> But as you uh, prepare to go home, I, I am confident that there yet remains a word from the Lord. And so um, we're going to turn to, um, to the Hebrew Bible, the, one of my favorite texts, one that's a little obscure for so many people, but in the Second Kings in chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 16 through 37. It's rather a long text and do a little bit of skipping, so I do need you to stay with me. And so it is that in verse 16, we read these words. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O oh man of God. But the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son just as Elisha had told her. And the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My, my head, my head, he said to his father. And so his father told a servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and had carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. And why, why, why go to him today, he asked. It, it's not the new moon. It's, it's, it's not the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. It's all right. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there is the Shunammite. Run to meet her. Uh, ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is the child all right? It's all right. Everything is all right, she said. And when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. Uh, she's in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said. Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elijah said to Gehazi, Tuck your cloak in your belt and take my staff in your hand and run. If, if you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And so Elijah got up and followed her. And then in verse 32, when Elijah reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on the couch. And he went in and shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy mouth to mouth and eyes to eyes and hands to hands. And as he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and then opened his eyes. I ask that you would focus with me on verse 26. Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. Pray with me this afternoon on the topic, all ready, all right. Tell your neighbor, I don't know what you're going through. But it's already all right. It's already all right. Three years after his son died from scarlet fever, days after all four of his daughters drowned in a shipwreck, otherwise successful lawyer Harold Horatio Spafford spin these words. 
When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. This great hymn might well be the song of praise for the Shunammite we encounter in today's text. The Bible says that she was a well-to-do woman who was older and, and had experienced some challenges. She was a member of the Issachar tribe. And the motto of the Issacharites was, be ready for the burden. And the Shunammite had a burden. In the context of a culture that assigned value to a woman on the basis of her capacity to bear children, particularly male children, she had none. And her barrenness was seen as a reproach from God. But despite the fact that her circumstances were not ideal, she went on with life. She was neither paralyzed by her pain nor burdened by her burden. She had come by faith to accept her situation. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. She was an extraordinary woman. And so it was that the man of God prophesied that she would give birth to a child. And a year later, she did. Oh, he was so precious. He had uh, his eyes, but that was definitely his mother's nose. He was stubborn like his dad, but that silly sense of humor, that was all his mother. Ah, but he had a mind of his own. He was a miracle. By God's grace, the child grew and became strong until one day he was out in the field with daddy. My, my head, my head, he proclaimed. Seeing that the boy was ill, the father responded as fathers have responded throughout the generations, take him to his mother. That's a different sermon. <laughs> and so the boy sat on the mother's lap. And over the hours, slowly dwindled away and died. And the mother took that which meant more than life itself up to Elijah's room and tenderly laid him on the bed, shut the door, and went out. She then prepared to proceed to the holy man of God. And when they asked her if everything was okay, she said, it's all right. But how can this be Shunammite? He's taken his last breath. It's all right. But Shunammite, the, the blood's no longer running warm through his veins. Rigor mortis has said, it's all right, it's all right. It's, it's already all right. The Shunammite was an extraordinary woman. And she demonstrates for us at least three strategies to employ when we're in the midst of a major crisis the importance of remaining calm and clear-minded to develop a plan, to be concentrated and focused on clarifying the plan, and to be committed to its full execution no matter what. The Shunammite was calm. You will observe that despite the fact that her most beloved baby had died, she was cool, she was calm, she was collected. 
As a physician, I have learned that when you're in the midst of an emergency, it is most important to have someone near you who's calm. But when the code blue is called, I would rather have a janitor who doesn't know what to do but remains calm than the chief of surgery who just panics. In the midst of the panic, you can lose the patient. Got to remain calm. You have to concentrate on what you have to do. You know that the Shunammite didn't tell anybody about the problem. You can't tell everybody everything. And sometimes you can't tell anybody anything. Because the naysayers will always be there to tell you you're wrong. We can say of the naysayers what Jesus said of the poor people. They will always be with you. Just like the husband. Someone's going to tell you, it's not the right day. No, 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 not now. It's not, it's not the right time. Don't, don't. Even as the Shunammite warned the servant, don't slow down. Someone's going to tell you, you're moving way too fast. Slow down. The Shunammite had to concentrate. You have to block out the interference and stay focused on the task at hand. And she remained committed to executing the plan all the way through. She was determined that the man who had prophesied at the time of the child's birth would be present to intercede at the time of the child's death. And so having encountered Elijah, I want to suggest that at that particular point in time, the Shunammite's personality takes a curious turn. Up to this point, we know her as being a wealthy woman, gracious, poised, polished, suave, and sophisticated. But having come 40 miles, riding on the back of a donkey, at high speed, only to encounter a man of God who is confused <laughs> and doesn't get why you're there, who suddenly become a flaky prophet, <laughs> something happened. Uh, how do I know that she then came out of a whole different bag? Well, just look at verse 28. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? It's a rhetorical question. There's really only one answer. It's like when your mother says, will you go get a glass of water for me? There's really only one answer. <laughs> and so she asked a rhetorical question. And let me make you wise. Beware a sister when she asks a rhetorical question. <laughs> And so in the twinkling of an eye, girlfriend became an SWA, a sister with an attitude. <laughs> and so, you know, it's OK to be prim and proper and dignified and gracious most of the time in a crisis. <laughs> but every now and then, you have to imagine yourself becoming like Superman. Go into that telephone booth, wearing your Nine West suit, your Liz Claiborne shoes, your matching Biggio hat, the diamond studs and the 14 karat gold necklace. You go in there, you exchange the suit for the house dress that you got off the clearance rack at Walmart, tie the rag around your head, put on your house slippers, take off the jewelry and put on the Vaseline. <laughs> and don't forget to put on the cape, the one that has an A for attitude and get down to the real nitty gritty. Excuse me, bro Elijah, did I ask you for a son? <laughs> Didn't I tell you do not be raising my hopes, yo? 
And what I love is the next line. It says that Elijah got up and followed her. <laughs> I suspect that that's a life-saving revelation for some men today. <laughs> we really will work with you brothers and be prepared to engage in long suffering, but don't mess with the sister when she's got an attitude. When we put on that cape, we are able to leap tall buildings in a single bounce. You will go outside and see something flying. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it is a sister with an attitude. <laughs> and I recommend that you simply get up and follow her. And so the word says that Elijah then went to the boy and stretched out eyes to eyes and mouth to mouth and hands to hand until the boy's body began to feel warm, but he still wasn't breathing. Let's just say he was still waiting to exhale. And so Elijah stretched out again until the boy began to breathe, and he sneezed seven times, seven times, seven times, and opened his eyes. Now, we could begin our celebration right here. <laughs> we could talk about how down through the ages somebody else would stretch out his self on an old rugged cross, and by him we would have life and life eternal. We could talk about the sheer power of this woman's extraordinary faith, that it was her already all right attitude in and of itself that changed death into life. But seminarians, I, I suspect the Shunammite would have us go deeper. Because we are they who are on the front line. And at any point in time, any one of us is confronted with the reality of people being affected by death and dying. And somehow we have to find our way beyond the spiritual platitudes. Allow me to introduce you to another extraordinary young woman. I met five-year-old Elizabeth from Maine when I was doing my second year of pediatric residency. Elizabeth had developed the worst form of childhood leukemia, for which we had no, no cure, and the best we could do was buy a little time for her. And I will tell you that sometimes the treatments were worse than the disease itself. We had a sign over the doctor's station that said, a doctor's duty is to cure occasionally, to relieve frequently, and to comfort always. I want you to understand, seminarians, that that is also your work. And so one morning, Elizabeth's mother greeted us as we were making rounds. Throughout the night, she had wrestled with the sense that she just wanted to stop the treatments and take Elizabeth home and just enjoy the time that they had together. That same morning, Elizabeth woke up. Five-year-old Elizabeth. I said, Mommy, I don't want to do this anymore. And so the two of them agreed that they would go back home to way upstate Maine and enjoy living out the rest of their lives in as normal a way as they could. Several months later, I was rounding on the oncology ward. And I heard singing coming from one of the rooms. That's, you don't usually do that on the oncology ward. And I looked in, and there was Elizabeth. She was getting an infusion of platelets. She, she, she was bleeding, so the platelets were designed to stop the flow. What was remarkable was that she and everybody else had on party hats. They had balloons. and. It was cake and ice cream. I wondered if it was her birthday. No, it wasn't her birthday. She explained to me that um, she was having a party because she'd been praying. And she paused to ask me if I knew what it meant to pray. And she explained that praying means that you talk to God. And then the wisdom of this child, this five-year-old child, she added, and God talks back to you. 
And she said God had told her that she was going to go to heaven and she was going to see her grandmother and she wasn't going to be sick anymore. So it was already all right. And she had a party. Elizabeth died several weeks later and I never saw her again. But a few months after that, I was paged to come to the hospital lobby. Her mother was there. When I arrived, her mother was carrying a, a black Raggedy Ann doll. What I hadn't realized is that I was the first black person that Elizabeth had ever met. And we were good friends. <laughs> and so when she went home, she went up to upstate Maine and found a black Raggedy Ann doll and named her Dr. Gloria. <laughs> I can well imagine that 40 years ago, this was the only black Raggedy Ann doll in the whole state of Maine. <laughs> Before Elizabeth died, she'd made out a will, and she willed Dr. Gloria to me. And so now Dr. Gloria sits in the chair in my study and reminds me that my work is to cure occasionally, to relieve frequently, and to comfort always. That's the kind of faith that Christ was talking about when he said that in order to get access to heaven, we have to become like one of these. And even in the midst of our dying, declare that it's already all right. I, I believe that the Shunammite would have us to understand that her declaration that it was all right was not a function of any wishful thinking. It, it wasn't standing on any particular verse. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, it, you can tell the mountains. It wasn't, there wasn't those platitudes that we so often trot out and, and, and say over and over and over again. The reason she knew it was already all right was because God told her so. And God is sovereign. And whatever my lot, he has taught me to say, it's already all right as well with my soul. And so if God says so, no matter how dead the situation is, if the child, God says that the child shall not die but live, cancel the undertaker, get a refund on your money, tell the missionaries to stop frying up the chicken, and don't make no more potato salad, because that child shall not die, but live. But this story is more than about dead children. It's about some things that sometimes we encounter in the ministry, dead hopes, dead dreams, dead visions. We, we had so much and so we just imagined and, and in the context of the reality of lived ministry, dead. And we, so many preachers have laid those visions in a room, closed the door and walked away. But I just stopped by to tell you that in those moments, Hold fast to your vision. Stay calm. You're not the first one. We, we all go through this. Stay focused. Don't, don't get distracted by the worry and the anxiety. Stay focused on the plan and commit to seeing it all the way through. Just a simple message. It's all ready. All right. If God says that your dreams are on point, start flapping your wings because his promise is that you're going to soar up on wings like eagles. It's already all right.
If God says it's true, don't let them steal your joy. Unspeakable joy is what he promises. It's already all right. It's been an awesome experience to encounter you. To experience the freshness of the anointing. You're at the stage where it's so, there's so much that's curious, trying so many different things and such big dreams. I want to admonish you to be clear about your calling. You have to choose whether you're going to serve God faithfully, become a minister, or cling to the hopes and dreams, the aspiration that's on TV, and become yet another mini star. Hold fast to the dreams that God plants in your spirit. Don't let them die. Trust God that it's already all right. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for these young preachers. To be able to meet at this point in our crossroads been around a little while, God. I'm, I'm the grandmother that David was talking about. And for the privilege to be able to pour into these young people at their stage, God. I don't know what they've been through, Lord. I don't, I don't even know what they're going through now, but by faith, God, I declare that it's already all right. I pray, God, that as they continue to go forward, you, you surround them with others of like-minded faith who, who have their best interests at heart, that you'd raise up some Elizabeths in their lives who would speak promise into their lives, God, who would affirm them for who they are, and that they would be like Mary, receiving that, that, that blessing. Blessed is he or she who has believed that what God has said to her, to him, will be accomplished. It, it's already pray, God, that they would be diligent and living a life of holiness. Then in a day when, when the rules are so unclear and the boundaries are so gray and, and, and truth doesn't seem to be true anymore and when the, when the walk doesn't necessarily have to match the talk, God, I pray for a spirit that's inclined to holiness that anyone who's coming behind them can look on their lives at any point in time and say, ah, that's the way I want to walk in it. Yea, God, that even the very thoughts that come into their minds would line themselves up with you, God. I pray these things. I come against any force, oh God, any person, oh Lord, who would derail them from that which you've established. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke them. These precious ones. And God, I thank you for the privilege, even now, of seeding into their lives. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. In Jesus' name.